<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Standing ovation, right? <laughs> I was talking to a, uh, a colleague of mine the other day on, on a um, um, committee, and he looked at me and he said, you know, when I was a student, he said, I never had any idea that professors look forward to the end as much as I did. And it's true. So professors look forward to the end as well. But I really enjoyed working with you guys. It's been a very good group. And you guys have had the highest averages I've ever had for a class consistently. So I'm very pleased, very impressed with that. Very cool. OK, so today I'm going to um, finish up talking about regulation of eukaryotic gene expression. Uh, and as we will see, that occurs at several levels. And I'm going to give you some examples for each of those levels. Um, and then we'll move uh, sort of slowly into uh, sensory um, and the senses, the molecular basis of sensing. When I finished last time, I was talking about the uh, fact that enhancer sequences are tissue-specific and that certain tissues will have the protein that may appropriately bind to that sequence and activate. In some cases, it can actually inactivate uh, transcription. And these enhancers give some tissue specificity for the expression of genes that are needed by those tissues. A very cool experiment is shown in the next slide I want to uh, show you to, tell, to, to, to illustrate uh, the specificity of enhancer action. What you see on the screen is a picture of a transgenic chicken or a transgenic chicken embryo. And this transgenic chicken embryo uh, was transformed taking an enhancer for a muscle uh, protein so that what the... Um, uh, what they had done was they had taken this enhancer for this muscle protein and they linked it to the beta-galactosidase gene. And the idea is that wherever the beta-galactosidase gene is being expressed, if you apply XGAL to this developing embryo, what you will see are the locations in the developing embryo where this muscle gene is being made. Now, the beauty of this, this technique and the beauty of this experiment is you can actually see specific places wherever the blues are where that gene is being made because the blue corresponds to where beta-galactosidase is cleaving the XGAL. And since this is an enhancer that's specific for muscle tissue, this is the place where the very earliest expression of muscle genes is happening during a developing embryo. Well, as you can imagine, this kind of technique is really useful for understanding gene expression during the process of development. And so it's a very, very powerful technique. And again, biochemists being lazy, using blue color as a way of helping us to find things really helps us in this case to understand how gene expression is happening during the process of development. Very, very cool experiment. Regulation of gene expression uh, in eukaryotes happens in a variety um, of ways. Um, it occurs at the level of whether or not transcription occurs, and it occurs at the level of how stable RNAs are. It occurs at the level of um, how accessible the chromosomes are to the RNA polymerase, and it occurs also at the level of the stability of protein. There's many. I'm just listing a few here, so I'm not going to come back and say list all the levels. That's not my purpose in mentioning this. But rather, uh, I want to show you this uh, and say a little bit about this uh, particular method. When we um, think about the um, regulation of gene expression in eukaryotic cells, uh, two big things come to mind. Uh, and these both involve covalent modifications of things. The first of these, as I'll talk about later today, is acetylation of, of uh, lysine residues in histones. That is, putting an acetyl group onto lysines. And as we will see, the effect that that has is to loosen up the chromatin structure to allow an RNA polymerase and associated proteins to get in there to start transcription. Another covalent modification that occurs occurs not to the histone proteins, but to the DNA sequence itself. And this modification that occurs in eukaryotic cells involves methylation of a cytosine. Okay? So methylation of a cytosine uh, here gives us uh, 5 methylcytosine. And the significance of this is that this methylation, if this cytosine is present in a promoter or a regulatory region for a gene, will tend to silence the gene. That is, it will tend to inhibit transcription of that particular gene. 
So DNA methylation is an example of a, what we refer to a, a, as an epigenetic modification uh, that occurs in cells. It's an epigenetic regulation. And epigenetic, epigenetics blah, 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 refers to non-genetic changes. Okay? And these non-genetic changes, such as putting a methyl group on, can actually be transmitted across generations. So prior to our um, unraveling or understanding of epigenetics, we had the um, uh, strong bias or strong impression that everything that an organism had was the product of the sequence of its DNAs. And as a result of our knowledge now of these modifications that we see that control how much of a gene is made, we now know, and the fact that they can be transmitted across generations, we now know that there are other factors involved in transmitting genetic information. Okay? So these epigenetic changes such as this, such as the acetylation of lysines and, his, and histones, um, are very, very uh, important factors in us understanding um, how genes are expressed. Well, what I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about one type of regulation we find in eukaryotic cells, uh, particularly things that affect multicellular organisms. Uh, you recall from our discussion last term that I talked about uh, hormones. We saw how, for example, epinephrine affected glycogen metabolism, and we saw how insulin affected uh, the metabolism of sugars and so forth and the import of sugars. Hormones do other things besides affect enzyme activities. And it's important for us to recognize that hormones uh, can also affect gene expression. So uh, estradiol is a female uh, sex hormone, and it is an estrogen. And it is a hormone that uh, can, um, uh, as I said, affect the uh, uh, expression of certain genes. So I want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about how it works. Estradiol works by interacting with a protein called the nuclear uh, domain receptor. Okay? And this nuclear domain receptor is um, a protein that has two specific um, domains on it. That is two specific structural regions. One structural, regions. one structural region is involved in binding DNA. And you see those little zincs right there. So I hope that you recognize that this guy has some zinc fingers. Um, to bind to a specific sequence in DNA. So this nuclear um, hormone receptor, nuclear domain receptor, uh, will in fact bind to a specific sequence or specific sequences in DNA and activate genes when this hormone has bound an estradiol and its other domain. Okay? So the other domain is a ligand binding domain, and the ligand here is estradiol. Okay? Now, um, these two uh, sites are separate from each other. We can destroy uh, the uh, estradiol binding site and the DNA do binding domain site will still stay intact. This figure shows uh, schematically what happens uh, upon the binding of estradiol by the nuclear hormone receptor. And the nuclear hormone receptor go undergoes a significant change. If you look at this little purple guy down here, you see that it lifts up and out of the way after it is bound to an estradiol. And that turns out to be significant for the action that this hormone has. Okay? So this structural change, again, as we've been saying for the past two terms, small changes in the structure of a protein can have some fairly uh, significant uh, impacts on the cell, and such is the case uh, here as well. Estradiol, uh, the, I'm sorry, the nuclear hormone receptor uh, does not um, by itself um, activate transcription. Okay? It's part of a series of steps that have to happen in order for the genes regulated by estradiol to uh, be expressed. The binding of the receptor is the first step in the process, however. So we see here that two nuclear hormone receptors have bound to the um, uh, specific target region of the DNA, and they have these two alpha helices, that's the purple region that we saw before, sticking out. And when there's no estradiol bound to those, then this other protein here called a coactivator is unable to bind. However, 
when estradiol binds, the two purple guys sort of fold out of the way, kind of like you saw in the last figure, and open up a binding site that this coactivator protein can now bind to. Okay? So this um, is an essential step in the activation of transcription of genes that are uh, controlled by this protein. Now I'm going to show you uh, a couple additional steps in a minute, but the critical thing from this slide is that estradiol is favoring a change in the structure of the nuclear hormone receptor, and this change in structure allows a coactivator protein uh, to bind. Okay? Everybody with me? Okay, so um, tamoxifen is a compound that is used to basically interfere with the um, function of estradiol. And tamoxifen uh, and this related compound, raloxifene, uh, can bind to the uh, nuclear hormone receptor and inhibit the binding of, of uh, the, act, the coactivator. So when tamoxifen, or this guy right here, binds, they can inhibit the binding of the coactivator to the nuclear hormone receptor. Well, as you might imagine, that has a fairly significant uh, effect. You can see the purple guy has moved out of the way, but this loop down here um, is not out of the way, and so the nuclear hormone receptor is unable to bind to this uh, coactivator when tamoxifen is bound to it. So that's a significant difference between the two. So we can imagine that when we treat with tamoxifen, what we're doing is we are locking up the nuclear hormone receptors, and as a consequence, they will not be able to go ahead and activate transcription of genes that otherwise would be turned on by estradiol. Well, how does the overall process work? The overall process works by virtue of the fact that the coactivators that are the coactivator that I showed you on the screen, and there are, there are several of these, um, are actually enzymes. And these enzymes have a very important function. Okay? These enzymes will take histones and they will acetylate them. They will specifically put an acetyl group onto the lysine of histones. Now, I mentioned that earlier. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the significance of that. Okay? So it actually is putting on a lysine onto the side chain. I'm sorry, putting a, an acetyl group onto the side chain of lysines in the histones. All right? Well, if we look at the unmodified lysine in the chain, we see, of course, that it has a positive charge. And when we add the acetyl group, we see it over here, we see that the positive charge has disappeared. Okay? So we've converted a protein that had a positive charge to a protein that has a zero charge. Well, obviously, DNA is negatively charged. The protein is positively charged. There's a nice, tight interaction that happens as a result of that attraction of the positive to the negative. If I remove the positive or I cover up the positive as I do here, then what happens is that attraction between the histone and the DNA is not nearly so tight. It's not nearly so tight. So as a consequence of that, that interaction between the histone and the DNA loosens, and that loosening is very important in ultimately allowing access of the um, uh, proteins in transcription to come in and do their thing. Okay? So this acetylation that's favored by the coactivator, and yes, a coactivator is a histone acetylase, that interaction is, uh, that, that modification favors now transcription ultimately of the gene. Well, we can see that, uh, oh, but before I say that, one of the things I should point out is that the acetyl lysines that you see uh, as a result of that modification are targets for proteins that have a specific structure called a bromo domain. So proteins that have a bromo domain will recognize and bind to acetyl lysines. All right? Proteins that have a bromo domain will recognize and bind to acetyl lysines. Well, the histones have an acetyl lysine, so this protein with a bromo domain binds to it. Well, what might a protein like that be like? Well, one of the proteins that does that is called a remodeling engine. So now I'm going to show you the whole process in the activation of a gene.
So let's start at the very beginning. So we have a transcription factor, in this case the nuclear hormone receptor, that is bound to a specific sequence of DNA. In this case, the transcription factor has bound to estradiol, and as a result of binding to estradiol, a coactivator can bind to that nuclear hormone receptor. That's what's happened right here. The coactivator is a histone acetylase, so it starts putting acetyl groups on lysines in the region where this has been bound. Okay? And as a consequence of that, proteins that have a bromo domain now can find those acetyl lysines and bind to them, and one of them that has a bromo domain is called a remodeling engine. I love that name, right? A remodeling engine. It sounds like something you'd run through your kitchen when it's really time to fix it up, right? Okay. So the remodeling engine has a very important function. Its function is to clear away a space for all of the transcriptional proteins to come in. So the remodeling engine opens up access uh, of the promoter to all these other proteins that's necessary for transcription. As a consequence, the binding of the nuclear hormone receptor leads to binding of several proteins that ultimately lead to activation of transcription. If tamoxifen binds to the nuclear hormone receptor over here, none of these steps happen. Therefore, transcription does not get activated. And if those um, genes are necessary for cellular proliferation, and cellular proliferation is what you're worried about because you have a cancerous cell that is responding to estrogen, what you have done is you just found a way to turn off the replication of that cancer cell, a very cool thing. Okay, good place for me to stop and take questions. Yes, sir. How localized is the area of effect of this histone acetylase? Is it within 1020 base pairs, or can it act a long, long ways away like some of your enhancer sequences? Yeah, so his question is, how far away can this guy uh, act? Um, it really is limited only by the accessibility of the bending of the DNA. So we can actually act over a region of several hundred base pairs. Other questions? Am I that clear, or are you guys that tired with the 10th week? OK. So that's uh, one example um, of how gene expression in eukaryotes uh, can be regulated. There are hundreds of others. I'm not going to go through those. But I do want <clears throat> to excuse me, talk about um, a couple of other schemes for uh, controlling gene expression in eukaryotes. So not all gene expression in eukaryotes is controlled at the level of whether transcription occurs or how much transcription occurs. All right? There are other control mechanisms, and some of these are translational in nature, and that's uh, one of these right here. Okay? So um, I want to uh, sort of make a left turn now and talk about another gene that is important, or another couple of genes in cells that are important and also very interesting. Okay? And um, the, genes, the gene that you see on the screen is the protein called ferritin, F-E-R-R-I-T-I-N. And ferritin is a protein that has a very important function inside of cells. It binds to iron. Okay? It will bind to iron. And um, it, there's a few thousand iron atoms that a, an individual ferritin can sequester in a structure that looks like this. Well, why, does, why do cells do that? Well, iron turns out to be a fairly toxic compound for cells, but cells need it also. Okay? So iron, because of its ability to be in the plus two, plus three state, has two different oxidation states. And if left free in the cell, it can produce reactive oxygen species. So cells are very careful to try to sequester iron as much as they can. If they're unable to sequester iron, they're much more likely to have oxidative damage happen to them. Okay? So it's important, therefore, that cells make the appropriate amount of ferritin to handle the amount of iron that they have. Well, it turns out that there's two, there are two proteins uh, to consider when thinking about iron within a given cell. Once the iron is in the cell, we want to have ferritin to gobble it up. Well, how do we govern how much iron gets into a cell? And that happens as a result of action of another protein called transferrin, and specifically the transferrin receptor. Okay, oh, I'm jumping ahead. 
So the transferrin receptor is a protein on the surface of the cell that facilitates the input of iron into the cell. Okay? So the two proteins that we're interested in are the transferrin receptor and ferritin. Ferritin holds the iron once it gets in. The receptor controls how much gets in. By The more receptor we have, the more iron will come in. The less receptor we have, the less iron will come in. So cells have to literally balance the two of these. And they do it in a very interesting way. They do it by regulating both the translation of genes and the stability of messenger RNAs. We're going to see both examples as we examine these genes. These two processes, the translation and the stability of the gene, are regulated as a result of action of something called the iron response element. Okay. The iron response element, looky there, is a structure kind of like you've seen before. You guys are going to get tired of seeing hairpins. And you discover that hairpins can do a variety of things. This guy doesn't have anything to do with termination of transcription. Okay. Doesn't have anything to do with termination of transcription. But instead, it's a target for binding by a protein that recognizes this structure. Now, in the past, I've called this protein IREBP, which is kind of a mouthful. And I'm going to call it IRP. Iron response protein, IRP. It's going to make you irp. Ha ha. Whew. Okay. All right. So IRP is a protein that can recognize this structure and bind to it. IRP is a protein that can also do something else. It can bind to iron. Now, IRP if it binds to iron, will not recognize this structure and will not bind to it. If IRP is not bound to iron, it will recognize this structure and it will bind to it. We're clear? Two situations, low iron or high iron. If we have low iron, IRP is going to bind. If we have high iron, IRP is not going to bind. Okay. I'm sorry. If we have high iron, yeah, it's not going to bind, right? Okay. Now, yes? This stem loop. I'm sorry? This is the messenger RNA for ferritin. Yeah, sorry, okay. So we're looking at the messenger RNA. If I didn't say that, I should say that. It's the messenger RNA for ferritin, all right? Now, this structure is present in the messenger RNA for ferritin. Now, what happens? Let's imagine we've got low iron. Low iron, that means that the IRP is not going to be bound to iron, which means it is going to be bound here. Okay? If the IRP is bound here, the ribosome comes along and says, okay, I'm going to translate this guy, and it hits the protein that's sitting right there, and it can't go any further. When the protein is on there, the ribosome gets stuck and will not translate this gene. It will not translate, it will not make ferritin. And that makes a lot of sense. Because if we have low iron, we don't want to waste energy making ferritin. Okay? If we have low iron, we don't want to waste energy making ferritin. If we have high iron, then what happens? Well, when we have high iron, the IRP binds to iron. It doesn't bind to this structure. This structure is therefore left open. The ribosome comes along and yes, it can translate and it goes all the way through there and it says, I'm making plenty of ferritin. And it's making ferritin when iron is high, which is what the cell needs to do because the cell doesn't want to have all this iron floating around freely. High iron, low iron, the cell is either making or not making ferritin. With me? Questions on that? You are a quiet group today. OK. Well, how about the um, uh, transferrin receptor? If we look at the, the coding or the, the messenger RNA for the transferrin receptor, which we see here, we see that it also has iron response elements located in it. And look at this. It's got a whole bunch of them at the 3' end of the gene. Okay. 
Now, in this case, what the IRP does is when it binds to an element, it stabilizes the messenger RNA and allows it to exist for a longer period of time, meaning you'll make more of it. And when there's no IRP bound here, the nucleases will start chewing it back and destroy the gene. So this mechanism, which uses the IRP, is controlling how much stable messenger RNA there is for the transferrin receptor. I'll, I'll step you through it in a second about how it works. Okay. So, no IRP bound, message unstable, decreasing amounts of messenger RNA. IRP bound, message relatively stable, more messenger RNA around. Okay? Well, let's use our information about low iron, high iron conditions. Under low iron conditions, is IRP going to be bound here or not? Low iron, IRP is going to be bound. Message is going to be stable. What's going to happen to the production of transferrin receptor? It's going to be favored. That makes sense. When we have low iron, the cell wants to bring in more. So it's going to make receptor to bring in more iron. When iron concentrations are high, on the other hand, there's no IRP bound to these guys. This message gets destroyed, and we make less transferrin receptor. That makes sense. We don't want to be making more, we don't be making more receptor to bring in more iron if we already have plenty. So one protein can control, in the first case, with the um, ferritin, how much protein is actually translated. In the second case, the same protein can control how much messenger RNA there is to be translated. They work in opposite ways, but because of the balance that they have, cells have the proper amount of iron within them, and that iron is ideally sequestered in a safe way. Questions about that? Do I see a question, or is that a... Is that a The thing that brings in the iron is the transferrin receptor, huh? Okay, right. So once it gets on the outside of the cell, that's, isn't that degradation degradation process? Because otherwise it's just adding the transferrin. Yeah, it's a very good question. So basically her question is, once you get it out in the cell membrane, uh, is it there forever? I think it's part of, part of what you're implying. And the answer is there's, there's many other levels of regulation. So no, it's not there forever. And proteins will get broken down over time. And so that's superimposed on top of this. But yes, that's a consideration. It's also a consideration for ferritin. Okay? So the stability of the protein is ultimately important in governing these as well. And I'm just simply showing you this mechanism, or these two mechanisms, as ways that cells can control things. But yes, the cell has to, has to govern how much of those individual proteins are present. Yes? I'm sorry, I can't hear what you said. Oh, does Okay, so her question is, does anemia affect these systems in any way? That'd be a really good exam question. What do you think? Will anemia affect this? I see some head shaking, yes. How would it, how, what would be your prediction that, that a person is not getting enough iron? What, what are we going to see happening in, this, in these systems? So what are you going to be making the most of if you have low iron? You're going to be making transferrin receptor, right? And you're making very little ferritin. So yes, that will affect things indeed. There went the exam question. Now I can't use it. I'll have to think of something harder. Ha, 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 ha. You're so funny, Kevin. Other questions? Jody? Is this RNA less stable at the free primate? Is that why it's stabilized so much by these iron response elements all being at that end? Yeah, his question is, is this guy fairly unstable at the 3' end? The answer is yes, it is. Um, and the stabilities of different messenger RNAs aren't completely understood uh, in terms of what makes them exactly you know, rock stable. Uh, 
longer uh, poly-A tails will affect that. But then the question is, well, why do some get a longer poly-A tail than others? What's the governing uh, principles in that? And that's not a completely understood uh, phenomenon. Emily? Yeah, so the question is, does IRB preferentially bind iron more than ferritin does? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, the IRB has a pretty high affinity for iron. It has to uh, because uh, it is literally competing with ferritin for that iron. And you don't mind if ferritin wins that, that battle, basically. But if there's a small concentration of iron that's not bound by ferritin, you'd really like to be able to get that... that um, uh, regulation there as quickly as you can. So it has a fairly high affinity for iron as a result of that. Yes, question over here? Right, so uh, IRB will bind the first hair from the on the left of the coating region, right? IRB will bind, uh, in the case of ferritin, yes. Uh, is it the same code as for the trans It's basically the same sequence here as there was at the five prime end of the other one. That's correct. Okay. Yes, back there. How is the iron removed from the ferritin? There's, now, there's a question that you should be thinking about. How do we remove um, non-covalently bound molecules? Nobody remembers from last term? What happens to them? Connie? They do. So they come off every now and then. Okay? So there's always an on and off and an on and off process. If it's not a covalent interaction, it's not stuck there permanently. And so as it comes off, it can be grabbed by something else. And that's, that's how that happens. Very good. OK. Is, is this sort of as straightforward as it looks as far as the binding and the affinity? Or is it under allosteric control like hemoglobin that changes its affinity in different parts or different situations? Uh, his question is, is there a, a cooperativity to the binding of iron here? And the answer is no, there's not. It's a, as far as I know, it's a single protein. It's not a multi-subunit protein. Yes? Yeah, good question. Is one IRP necessary, or is it more stable with more on there? The answer is the more that there are on there, yes, the stabler it will be. Uh, and these are all relative things, so it's not an absolute on or off, but I'm going to have more if I have more of these guys bound. And so if there's more IRPs, there is the more IRPs there are, the more messenger RNA will be there. That's correct. It's a dose effect. Okay. All right, well, the last thing I want to talk about, um, let's see, that was the IREBP, which I'm now calling IRP. You can see it there, versus low iron, blah, blah. And um, the last thing I want to talk about with respect to regulation is actually, uh, I put it under translation, but it's more under the uh, effect of stability of messenger RNAs as well. And this is a, uh, the action of a, uh, a set of... Um, RNA molecules that are relatively, have been relatively recently understood. And these have happened in the past 10 years. Uh, they're known as uh, microRNAs, and microRNAs are synthesized uh, by cells as a way of controlling, and this seems very odd, but it's true, as a way of controlling how much of a given RNA, a given messenger RNA, they have that's stable. So the cell goes to all the way through the trouble of making a messenger RNA, and then it decides, how much of this do I really want to have? It seems wasteful, and yes, it is wasteful, but it provides the cell with an additional way of regulating how much messenger RNA it has. How does it work? Well, cells synthesize small, single-stranded RNAs called microRNAs that get processed and they get processed into little pieces of 22 nucleotides. And those 22 nucleotides are generally specific for specific messenger RNAs, meaning that they are complementary to them. So if I make a microRNA that's complementary to, let's say, a gene for globin, for which I need hemoglobin, that complementary microRNA will pair with it inside of a protein called argonaut, and the argonaut will cleave that messenger RNA, thereby rendering it non-functional or at least less functional. 
Now, this might seem like it's an odd mechanism, but there are at least 700 human genes that are regulated exactly this way. The more of a given microRNA is made, the less stable the messenger RNA that's complementary to it will be. Okay? Very interesting stuff. So it's an important control mechanism, again, for regulating how much messenger RNA a cell has. We could imagine this could occur, again, at a variety of levels. It could occur at the level of tissue, different stabilities in different tissues. We could imagine it could occur as a result of hormone action, a variety of things that would govern how much of a given messenger RNA is present in a given cell. Okay, questions about that? Yes, Connie? Um, how is that different from siRNA? How is that different from siRNA? So siRNA is it's, it's related in a sense. SIRNAs um, arise as a result of the, the, the silencing action arises from double-stranded RNA. And double-stranded RNA gets, uh, one of the strands gets peeled away and uh, bound by another protein called RISC. I'm just telling you this because you asked. You don't need to know this, okay? Um, and the RISC complex actually goes and does a very similar thing, all right? But the difference being that a silencing RNA and siRNA starts out as a double-stranded RNA. This guy is starting out as a single-stranded RNA. And cells have um, a mechanism for dealing with this probably because you think, well, what, when do we have double-stranded RNAs present in our cells? Okay. I don't have double-stranded RNAs except for my, my you know, loops of my tRNA or my loops of my ribosomal RNA. When would cells have double-stranded RNAs? Well, many viruses ha that are RNA viruses actually have double-stranded RNAs as part of their life cycle. And so it's probably a protective mechanism that when the cell recognizes this double-stranded RNA, if I make silencing, if I, if I take a piece of this, I can silence genes of the virus. So it's probably a protective mechanism against that. Does that answer your question? Yes? Oh, that's a good question. This process, um, as far as I know, takes place in the nucleus. Yeah. Good question. Okay. So um, that's where we finish talking about gene expression. It provides us a perfect opportunity for a song. This is just a general song. It has nothing to do with uh, gene expression, but it does have to do with how you might be studying. And I know there's some people who couldn't make it today, which is why I thought of this song. So it's to the tune of Feeling Groovy. Oh, no, I miss my class. Someone ought to kick my ass. Perhaps there is some hope for me. Did Ahern make an online movie? Na, 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 na. Online movie. Dr. Kevin's always blowing, telling me I should be knowing all that biochemistry. I hope there is an online movie. Na, 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 na. Online movie. Got sweat on my brow. I'm starting to weep. I fire up my laptop. I'm white as a sheet. As Firefox is downloading, I'm feeling neat. Because I just found the online movie. Na, 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 na. Okay. A short one today. Mercifully short, given my singing. Okay. Well, now we turn our attention to some bigger systems. All right? And these bigger systems um, are, we can start understanding them because we've now got the tools of biochemistry at the molecular level to begin to understand how senses actually work. Okay? So this is kind of cool stuff. Um, we're going to talk about smell. We're going to talk about uh, taste. We're going to talk about vision. And we're going to talk about hearing and touch. So we've got five senses there that we'll be talking about. And uh, smell is where I will start. Okay? This uh, schematically shows um, the various senses. Of course, you know where all these senses are located. And we see some connection to various regions uh, of the brain that allow us to process the information that our senses are telling us. As we will see, the individual senses have very different strategies for functioning, very different strategies for telling us uh, what it is that they have detected. Okay? And some of these are really cool and interesting. Smell is particularly interesting. 
here are some things that we can smell. Okay? There's almond. There's skunk. I think I'll stay away from that one. There's rose. And there's zinc, zinc, zingiberine, ginger. Okay, I, didn't, okay, I can't even say that. So, um, you can't look at it and say, well, I think I know what that is, with the possible exception of this guy right here. Thiols tend to have a fairly uh, strong uh, scent. But nothing else on here really jumps out at us in terms of structure telling us what um, the smell will actually be. Look at these guys. They're identical in structure. They are simply stereoisomers. Identical chemicals except for the orientation of uh, the uh, things in three-dimensional space. The orientation of this carbon right here determines whether it's spearmint or caraway. Okay? R carbone versus S carbone. Pretty cool. So this tells us that no surprise, the structure of the molecules are very, very important in our ability to uh, have uh, proteins and other things interact with them, and in this case, send signals to our brain. This is the same thing I just showed you before, but now it shows us uh, up close and personal what the nasal epithelia look like. Okay? Nasal epithelia have on their surface they have neurons that uh, terminate at the location where these scents are coming into the brain. And it's these termini that are the places where the signal that gets sent to our brain starts. Okay. If we look at the various things that we can smell, we discover that we, just, we have various specific um, receptors for smells. Okay? So we've got about 30 active receptors. Well, we can smell more than 30 things, so what does that mean? It means that any given smell that we have may be binding, and in fact usually is binding, to more than one receptor. And the efficiency with which it's bi binding to any given receptor tells our brain a different signal. Okay? So we get more than 30 smells. The smells that we see are blends of those that our brain basically builds for us. If we compare us to all the other mammals that are out there, we see that um, we are on the low end of the scheme. Okay? And if we compare it to something like a mouse or a rat, we discover that they've got way more than we do. Well, it turns out we have the same genes that mice and rats have for smell. It's just that many of ours have been inactivated over time. Okay? Why? Well, we're not quite as dependent upon smell for finding food as a mouse or a rat is. Human beings do use smell, but not in the same way that a mouse or a rat does, which is why mice and rats are what they are. Okay? Um, this schematically shows uh, one of the proteins involved in the reception of uh, smell. And um, there's, uh, as you can see, it's a transmembrane uh, domain protein. You can see that it goes across seven times, meaning it's a 7TM. And um, this shows us how the process works at the level of smell. Okay. So here's an odorant. What is an odorant? An odorant is one of those molecules I showed you before. And specifically, an odorant is something that will bind to and stimulate an olfactory receptor protein. We see that olfactory receptor protein up close and personal here. It looks just like we saw before where we had the epinephrine receptor, which was known as the beta adrenergic receptor. It was a 7TM. In this case, the odorant is binding to the receptor. And guess what happens? It induces a small change in the structure of that protein. That small change activates a G protein, just as we saw before for epinephrine. That causes the G protein to let go of its GDP and bind to GTP. That activates it. The activation of that protein activates, uh, it causes it to interact with adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase synthesizes cyclic AMP, and now in the case of this particular uh, nerve cell, the cyclic AMP binds to a receptor and lets in sodium and calcium. 
Letting in of sodium and calcium, you recall from our talk about nerve cells, disturbs the electronic environment. It changes the voltage, in other words, and a signal has just started. Okay? So we've just, this cell has just said, okay, I have bound to something that is an odorant. I'm going to tell the brain that I've got it. I'm going to fire. Okay? So this guy is now firing this wave of voltage will move down the uh, nerve cell, ultimately telling the brain that it is bound to something. Now what the brain's going to do is it's going to look at the pattern of all the receptors that give us, give us this signal. Here's receptor number 11. And this receptor number 11 uh, is firing in about 10% of the cases, but receptor number 29 is firing in about 75% of the cases, and now your brain says, oh, I know what that is. Your brain picks, it basically draws that picture for you that you perceive as smell. Okay. Uh, we don't need to talk about that. Yeah, this is what I wanted to say. So this illustrates a little bit about what I was saying uh, before in terms of different receptors and the effect of different molecules on the binding of those receptors. We see for example, here's an odorant, a C7, a, a car seven carbons long with a hydroxyl group. And we can see it really doesn't interact with receptor number one. It does some interaction with receptor number two, none with number three, none with number four, a little bit over here. And that's the pattern that this guy illustrates. If we look across this, we see very little similarity of the overall pattern of any given one that's here. Okay? Here's a C8 that looks kind of like a C7, but even there, the C8 is firing number 14 and C7 isn't firing. C7 is firing this guy here. What you see on the screen is why you can smell so many different things. It's really cool. It's really interesting that the brain is drawing those pictures uh, for us. And I call them pictures because I can't think of any other way to describe what the brain is doing except making this up for you to give you the impression of smell. The uh, various olfactory, olfactory senses do converge in a given what's called a bulb, and that bulb then coordinates a signal that goes to the brain. So that coordination of the signal is important, as you could imagine, and uh, allows us to detect, again, very specific things, but also to get a wide range of things that we're able to detect. Okay, that's um, probably a good place to stop for today. I'm going to stop there, and I'll talk about taste and vision next time. For 332, when through, should the course synopsis write up if we want our current grade? What day should it Thursday. go through? Thursday. Through Thursday? Yeah. And you want it by when? Oh, I'm sorry. It'll, it'll, no, it'll go through Tuesday. I want it on Thursday. Oh. Yeah. So I'm going to talk tomorrow. Thursday is going to be mostly just a um, uh, uh, discussion. It's not going to be anything new. Okay. 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 Are those the note cards? Oh, yeah. Note cards. If you didn't get a note card, get a note card. How you doing? No card. Okay, you came. One, please. One, please. Everybody, can take one. Yep.